Today I want to talk about how general relativity causes redshift. And yes, the Hubble redshift, not just any old redshift. And to begin with, general relativity in its current form requires that every photon interacts with all matter, which makes changes in the trajectory of the photon. And that's important. And it's sort of a mocking effect, and I'll get back to that later. But in order to understand, I'm really talking about quantum general relativity. So we have to model of, we have to have a model of quantum general relativity, and we also need to have a good model for inertia of the matter, because only then can we understand how the photons and the matter are actually interacting with each other. And that tells us that not only is there an action of matter on the photon, there's a reaction where the matter reacts to the photon. And one of the important things to understand at first is the speed of light is determined by the permittivity and the permeability of the quantum field. And this is the well-known equation that epsilon mu equals one over c squared, or you can flip it around and c equals one over the square root of epsilon mu. So we can understand the speed of light is a function of the permittivity and permeability, the electric and magnetic constant of the quantum field. The, those constants actually emerge from the quantum field if you have a polarizable field model of the quantum field. And in order to have electric and magnetic fields, you must have polarizable something in space. And that something really needs to be dipoles at a minimum in order for it to work, and maybe at a maximum too. And because we also have the Casimir effect, which occurs, which also requires that space has dipoles. So we have this space filled with dipoles that produces electromagnetic fields and the Casimir effect. And that's where the permittivity and permeability and the speed of light limit come from. Now we also need to understand the speed of light limit for matter comes from the same place because it's the same speed of light limit. So the speed of light limit of matter is also a function of the permittivity and permeability of the quantum field. So matter must be interacting with the quantum field in some way for it to have the same speed of light limit. But this tells us that Matter's speed of light limit is determined by the permittivity and permeability. It's a function of the same thing. Which would only be true if quantum fluctuations are trying to move. So the best way to model inertia that's consistent with quantum field theory and the speed of light limit is if when matter's moving, it causes quantum fluctuations to rotate and the quantum fluctuation rotation causes matter to move. And so we have a simple form of self-induction that looks a lot like magnetic self-induction, except it's electrically neutral. And we can understand this even better once we understand how the permittivity and permeability arise. And that's because when you have a sea of dipoles, as is needed for electric and magnetic fields to exist, you not only have the Casimir effect, you have what's called Casimir torque, or Van der Waals torque, to go back to an earlier scientist. And Van der Waals interactions are interactions between dipoles, but they also resist rotation. And Van der Waals torque is normally talked about in chemistry more than quantum field theory. But you can't have a sea of dipole without having torque. 
And what it means is it resists rotation of quantum fluctuations and rotations of bodies of matter. And it resists rota forward motion as well. So both linear and angular motion are determined by the van der Waals torque of the quantum field, which determines the speed of light limit. And then stepping back to inertia, if you have a form of inertia that is like self-induction, an inductive type, that expands into a Maxwell force, very much like the electromagnetic force, but without electric charges. It's electrically neutral. And so what this means is that matter and photons are interacting in a Maxwellian way that behaves very similar to how we think about electromagnetic interactions occurring. So we can look at it, and this idea goes back to Newton and, and then Einstein last century, that matter changes the dielectric constant of space, or in particular, the permittivity and permeability of space. And I think matter does that by increasing the van der Waals torque. When a star exists, the van der Waals torque near it increases, making rotation of quantum fluctuations harder. And by making the rotation of quantum fluctuations harder, it makes polarization harder, which changes the permittivity and makes it higher, and makes permeability harder, the flux of magnetic field is more harder, and so that increases the permittivity. And by increasing the permittivity and permeability near matter, it decreases the speed of light. And what we get is a form of quantum general relativity, and special relativity too. They can be thought of, of changes in permittivity and permeability in the speed of light which gives us what's sometimes called the variable speed of light model of quantum general relativity. And the VSL model of general relativity has been examined and discussed by many physicists through the years. Um, Einstein first, uh, Wilson, Dickey, and then more recently physicists like myself. So this is not really a new model, but it's a model I'm going with in this case to explain redshift. So what's important to understanding redshift is not only does matter cause the van der Waals torque and permittivity and permeability to increase, photons cause van der Waals torque and cause the permittivity and permeability to increase. And that changes the momentum of matter. And changes to the momentum of matter take energy. The energy has to come some, from somewhere, so it must come from the photon. So the photon loses energy. It can't lose velocity. Once it passes the matter, it regains its velocity. So it loses energy. And that's how redshift happens. Photons and matter are interacting with each other. And it's a problem anytime in physics, you have to be able to solve a problem from the rest frame of both objects. So not only do you have to look at the bending of light from the rest frame of the star, you have to look at what happens to the star from the rest frame of the light. And if you don't understand both things, then you haven't really fully understood the problem. And I don't think any of this, based on my knowledge of quantum field theory, is optional physics. That there must be, once we have quantum general relativity and inertia, there must be a relationship between matter and photons that works both ways. Matter changes the motion of the photons, photon changes the motion of the matter. 
And this has actually been calculated in a way. Uh, Amitabha Ghosh using a inertial model, an inductive inertial model that was developed by Siyama, came up with a calculation that showed that the redshift due to this mechanism in the Hubble redshift should be very similar, if not identical. And the thing about Siyama's model, it was a Machian model of inertia, where a body moving is interacting with all the matter in space, rather than with the quantum field, as I say. Because in the Machian model, there's no explanation for how the two bodies of matter are interacting in order to create inertia. So I put it a different way, where I say inertia is interaction with the quantum field, which leads to a mocking effect related to redshift. But Siyama recognized that this type of interaction has a Maxwellian form to it in the way that matter and photons interact with each other. And Ghosh realized that he could calculate redshift. So Z, which is the change in the wavelength over the wavelength, is equal to a constant k divided by the speed of light times x, the distance, which is basically the linear Hubble redshift model, where k is a form of the Hubble redshift constant. And so Ghosh was able to calculate k and show that it's equal to 1.21 times 10 to the minus 18 per second in this equation. While the Hubble redshift, k is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18 per second. And Ghosh used an estimate of 7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per meter cubed, a little over 4 protons per cubic meter. So if you use a density estimate that's slightly greater, you could get exactly the Hubble redshift constant k in this equation. So this shows that using a simplified approximation of the Hubble redshift using inertial, inductive inertial redshift model, you end up with the correct amount of redshift to explain Hubble redshift. And it's linear, which conforms with the experimental observations so far. So this is what I think is happening. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you do, please like it, share it with your physicist friends who you think might be interested, and subscribe if you want to see more of my research and what I think about other people's research. And if you'd like to learn more about my quantum field theory research and my uh, particle theory research, I do have books for sale. And as always, I want to thank my PayPal, Patreon, and Super Thanks supporters. You really helped me out. So thanks for watching.